long do things that are in economic interest as well as in our uh, broader uh, human interest. Okay, we know that people don't do fantastically well in appreciating risks. If a risk hasn't come to fruition in the last three years, we might think, I don't need to worry about that. If it came to fruition yesterday, we might think, I'm terrified, that's really awful. And that isn't the worst thing to do, to think about whether it happened recently, but it's not the best thing to do. It can make us hyster hysterically fearful of things that aren't really worrisome, and it can make us very complacent about things that are quite worse. So now we have a picture of humanity emerging. This is the kind of a snapshot of the behavioral revolution where we can be uh, bound to the status quo. We often focus on the short term, not the long term. We really hate losses and we are, um, uh, are not great at perceiving risk. Okay, that's the first stage of the behavioral revolution. The second is what are we gonna do about it? What are we gonna do now to help people? And in communities all over the world, in private institutions, in Australia and the UN, certainly at the World Health Organization, the Asian Development Bank, there are interest in tools that are either educative or architectural. I want to put that distinction in bright lights as if it's a movie, not the most interesting movie, but there's a movie that has educative and bright lights and it has the word architectural in bright lights. Educative interventions might be as simple as you're about to buy something or do something and you get a signal that there's a risk associated with it. Might be you're about to buy a product and it has a health risk associated with it and the product has on it warning. This contains peanuts or shrimp or warning. There are a lot of calories associated with it. So information is one kind of educative intervention. Another, and this is a terrific behavioral intervention, is reminders. So the human mind is often occupied by lots of stuff. And if we are about to face a health risk or an economic risk, we might not be focused on it. If there's a reminder by text message or some kind of communication, it can save people's lives and make all the difference. If we learn what the social norm is, then most people, for example, are eating healthier or most people aren't discriminating on the basis of sex as much as people did a while ago. That can activate um, an interest in acting consistently with the social norm, and it can create a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. Those are educative interventions. Then there are also architectural interventions. So if people are automatically enrolled, let's say, in green energy, it makes a huge difference to climate change because people tend not to opt out, remember inertia. If people are automatically enrolled in some kind of healthcare program, that can make a big difference because people will say, okay, I'm in. Um, I'll do the things that are in the interest of my health. That's about architecture, not education. And I'll end this little tale uh, with breaking news from this week, which is an academic paper which shows if there is a pharmacy that gives vaccines near people, the likelihood that people will get vaccinated increases very dramatically. Now, I want to emphasize that because we often highlight vaccine hesitancy and people are scared of vaccines. People don't trust the people are providing vaccines. If you put the retail pharmacy near the people, so it's really easy to get the vaccine, then the likelihood they get vac vaccinated jumps. And the broader lesson there is the kind of principal lesson maybe of the behavioral revolution is that we often overlook how crucial it is to make it easy for people to get something. If it's a little bit hard, the negative effect can be very severe. If it's really easy to get help, in the case of, let's say, domestic violence or a health risk or an economic uh, problem, it's really easy to get help. That can be more impactful than, uh, than economics or anything else. Uh, ease of access, ease of availability is uh, often crucial to improving people's lives. 
Thank you, Cass. You have expressed that behavioral science knowledge is raising new questions in fundamental issues. The issue that you consider under scrutiny include nothing less than, let's say, the role of the government, freedom of choice, paternalism, and human welfare. Could you give us some examples of how behavioral science is questioning these issues, these areas? Okay, great. Uh, so let's talk about the role of the government first. Um, some governments think if people aren't doing what they should, we should punish them. That's pretty natural. Or if we think punishment is a little severe, we should tax them or fine them, not really punish them. And that's the repertoire of tools. Punish, fine, tax. Maybe subsidize if you want to encourage that. What the behavioral revolution suggests is there's a lot more you can do. You can, for example, uh, ask people to make a choice. You can say, do you want to do this or that? Just asking people whether they want to do the thing increases often the number of people who do the thing. You don't need to punish people. Instead of taxing people or subsidizing people, you can just make it simpler for people to get access to something. If people have access to the internet, then you can make it online rather than in writing. You can say if people have access to the internet, you don't have to go to a place, you can just click on something. No in-person interviews. You can get telemedicine rather than um, uh, having to go into a doctor's office. That's a way of changing behavior that doesn't involve subsidies or fines, just making things easy for people. You can say people are automatically enrolled in certain kinds of plans, but they can opt out if they want. That costs often close to nothing, but in some countries, automatically enrolling people in plans has a much greater effect than giving people a lot of money to enroll in plans. So that's a different kind of tool. It's also the case that if we use simple educative interventions sometimes, if they are either uh, really pleasing, so people think this would be really fun or positive, or if we, in cases where something really is threatening, do something to activate fear. Those are things that don't involve threatening people with punishment, but they involve indicating to people, if you don't take care of yourself, you might find yourself in real trouble. And there are some simple things you can do to take care of yourself. I'm thinking particularly of India here, where there's been a great deal of work recently that's behaviorally informed, that's focused a lot on public health and poverty reduction. And the tools that are being used aren't punish and tax or and fine. They are much more in the direction of uh, preserving freedom of choice, but thinking of human behavior as a way of uh, improving outcomes. Now for welfare, I'm only gonna talk a little bit about welfare. There are some people who think that people's choices are the perfect clue to what's in there when to promote their welfare. So if people choose to do this, that's in their welfare. If people choose to do that, that's in their welfare. But sometimes people need the equivalent of a GPS device. That is, they don't know how to get to where they want to go. They don't see the direction. It might be that they end up smoking. It might be that they don't take advantage of an educational opportunity. It might be that they don't get vaccinated. It might be that they don't wear masks. I'm giving uh, current examples. It might be that they do something that means they're going to die at 35 rather than at 85. And to say their choices are automatically going to promote their welfare, that's a, that's a good start often, but it's much too simple if what we're concerned about is the well-being of our brothers and sisters. Thank you. Can I ask you, from your point of view, what type of behavioral science informed interventions are likely to become mainstream into public policy making in the coming years? Okay. 
Thank you for that. I'll tell you my very favorite, and it's really simple. So we're gonna talk a little bit about theory and then we're gonna talk about practice. Um, we know something a lot better than we did 15 years ago about the human mind. And what we know is that there's limited bandwidth. So that the number of things that you are focusing on, and I'm thinking now of the 585 of you online, the number of things that you are focusing on, I hope, is a small subset of the number of things that matter to you in life because you're focusing on these remarks. But there are a thousand and one other things that are relevant to you that you are not focusing on. Thank you for that. That is often a good thing and it enables us to go through our day, but it means that we have limited capacity to attend to a lot of stuff that really can make our life go better or worse. If you are old or poor or lonely or really busy or hungry, then you will focus on fewer things than if you don't have those characteristics. Because if you are elderly and let's say facing health risks or cognitive decline, you can't focus on a ton of things. And if you're poor, you're focused on your economic situation, you better be rather than on your long-term future. And if you are hungry, you're focused on one thing, which is how am I gonna get food? And that means that the number of other things you can focus on is really small. Okay, that's academic about scarcity in the head. Now let's talk about um, administrative burdens, sometimes referred to as slight. So there are institutions, the United Nations is one, the United States is another, Italy is a third, um, the World Health Organization is another. I love all of these institutions, by the way, so I'm singling out my favorites. All of these impose a lot of sludge on you. So to get benefits that can maybe move toward um, the sustainable development goal, people have to navigate a lot of sludge. And I'm seeing in my mind's eye, nodding among the 500 plus of you, that in your jobs, you encounter a lot of sludge. The people whom you're trying to help often encounter a lot of sludge. If you're trying to get people educational opportunity or protection against some uh, terrible thing in their lives, it might be there's a lot of sludge and it's like a wall between people and an improvement in what I think will become mainstream pretty soon, it's already starting, is efforts to reduce administrative burdens and sludge in the interest of uh, helping particularly vulnerable people, but not only vulnerable people, even people who are doing pretty well, get access to things that can make their lives better. This often involves government institutions, might involve the United Nations or uh, Canada, but it also involves private institutions, which are trying often to provide goods and services that could really help people, but because they have to navigate sludge, it's really hard. Guess how many hours the United States government imposes in paperwork burdens on the American people? According to a recent count, that's 11 billion hours, 11 billion hours. It would be shocking if that wasn't too high. And if you cut sludge, you tear down a wall that separates people from opportunity, uh, training, poverty reduction, help for mental health problems, uh, help for uh, extremely serious challenges. It's a noble endeavor. And it's not part of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights yet. Hey, thank you, thank you, Cass. Before we let you go, I know that you're working on a new book uh, and last time we, we spoke, I was really intrigued by the topic and, and uh, what you're covering. Can you give us a little insight into what this book is all about? Yes, the book's about adaptation. So a number of people a few years ago were asked to work from home and they thought, you're kidding, right? I'm gonna work from home, nothing could be worse than that. And there was a lot of stress and horror about the idea of working from home. More recently, a lot of people are being asked not to work from home, but to go into the office. And there's a lot of stress and horror 
about the idea of going into the office. So the idea is the human capacity to adapt is massive, which is a really good thing that we can get used to things that we would have thought were very difficult. But it's also a terrible problem. If you're under conditions, let's say, of inequality or poverty or poor health or environmental terribleness, people will often, I just find that word terribleness, I don't think it's a real word, <laughs> that. Uh, but if you're in under conditions of dirty air, we know that people are, get used to it and they adapt to it, even if they're getting sick. And this is a blessing in the sense that people aren't beating their heads against the wall. But for the sustainable development goals and for all of us, really, it's a policy challenge where people have gotten habituated to something which really makes their lives uh, shorter and worse. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. We know you have to go, so really appreciate uh, giving us a bit of your time. And uh, you're more than welcome to stay, but we know you have to go. So again, thank, thank you, you on behalf of all of us. Really it's appreciate it. It's an honor it. and a pleasure, and it's an honor and pleasure to see you and my great friends, Mary. Thank you all. Thank you. Now we move to the second second segment of the event, a discussion with uh, Dr. Dilip Solman, Dr. Mary McLennan, and Dr. Renos Vakis. Uh, let me introduce uh, the, the, the guest uh, for the second part of this event. Dilip Solman is a, a Canada Research Chair in Behavioral Science and Economics at Rutman School of Management, University of Toronto. He's the co-author of Managing Customer Values uh, 2022, author of The Last Mile 2015, and co-editor of the Behaviorally Informed Organization that came out last year in 2021, and Behavioral Science in the Wild this year, 2022. Mary McLennan is the Senior Advisor on Behavioral Science in the UN Executive Office of the Secretary General, where she leads behavioral science effort. She's also the lead of the UN Behavioral Science Group in the UN Innovation Network. In these roles, she expands and supports behavioral science application across the UN. She is currently a senior visiting fellow at the London School of Economics. Renos Vakis is a lead economist at the World Bank with the Poverty and Equity uh, Global Practice, where he leads the Mind, Behavior, and Development Unit. The unit integrates behavioral science in the design of anti-poverty policies in a wide range of issues, such as financial inclusion, social cohesion, human development, and employment. He has written extensively on issues related to poverty dynamics and mobility aspirations, mental well-being and social protection. Now, let me start with Dilip. Um, in your work on the importance of behavioral science for public policy design, you use the term sludge. Can you explain to us what do you mean by sludge in this context? Over to you, Dilip. Terrific. Thank you. And, and like Cass, I, I thank you and the college for putting this together again. I agree. Timely uh, and, and a really important discussion uh, to be had at this point in time. So Cass already alluded to the notion of sludge, and he spoke about sludge as paperwork burdens, administrative burdens, things that we make difficult for people to do. And I want to nuance that a little bit, right? So uh, I like to think of uh, sludge as sort of frictions that exist in the ability of our citizens, of our customers, of various stakeholders to getting things done. Right now, one sort of friction you could experience is a process, right? So if there is something that people need to do, let's say apply to get a business permit or a fishing license or uh, pay taxes, um, do we have more forms than are necessary? Do we have more steps than are necessary? Uh, and that's sort of one, one way of thinking uh, about uh, the, the friction or the sludge that we create. But there are other ways in which sludge could be created. I wanna focus on, on a couple of them for a moment. Uh, the first has to do with information, right? Um, sometimes we find that 
we tend to give people too much information uh, and sometimes we give people too little, right? And, and of course, this is like Goldilocks. You don't want to give people too much. You don't want to give them too little. Uh, but think about a simple uh, decision like uh, deciding how you want to invest your retirement funds uh, in many countries uh, where we believe in the concept of free choice. Citizens could allocate their money across one of hundreds of funds. And what you would do is you would receive a prospectus in the mail. Uh, it might look something like this big book. Uh, and on each page, there'll be a chart and figures. And then there's a form at the end which says, how do you want to allocate your money across all of these funds, right? Now, uh, that's to me is an example of sludge. It's, it's sludge because it is essentially burdening people with so much information that they may choose not to choose at all. Right? And, uh, and of course, sometimes you get the opposite problem. We don't give people enough information. Um, but, but information itself is one big source of sludge. We make it confusing. We make it difficult to understand. Um, look at you know, uh, information on disclaimers, right? Uh, I just went to the pharmacy uh, yesterday to pick up a prescription. And along with my medication, I opened it up. There was a long form listing all possible side effects I could have. Uh, of course, culminating in death uh, at some point in time. Uh, and again, you, you start questioning why that information is there. Uh, but the point is, oftentimes we make information really difficult to process. We make it not appropriate for the level at which people are ready to receive it. So that's one source of sludge. But the third source of sludge is the one that I'm particularly interested in, and that has to do with what I call the emotional spotlight. So let me give you a concrete example of this. Uh, Mary is familiar with this. Uh, she and I actually spoke about this a long time ago when she was uh, in, in Canada. Um, and at that point in time, 2014, 2015, the federal government in Canada had introduced something called a Canada Learning Bond. Uh, and I'm going to simplify what it is, it's basically a welfare program designed to provide every eligible low-income Canadian with $2,000 worth of quote-unquote free money. Uh, and I use the term free money because that was the way it was advertised uh, and promoted. Free money as long as the money is used to educate children. Right? And it turns out, I remember being in the room when this program was announced, there were a number of people who made comments such as, who would not take $2,000 of free money? Now, it turns out about 86% of eligible Canadians did not take up uh, the $2,000 that they were entitled to. Uh, of course, the first reaction was perhaps people don't know about this program. And so we spend more time promoting it and doing door-to-door -door campaigns and road shows. And, and that pushed up the 14% to 14 and a half or 15 uh, no, no dramatic improvement. Um, and it turns out that uh, the reason why people weren't taking the money wasn't because they didn't know about it, uh, or it wasn't that they didn't want to educate their children, but it was sludge. Uh, and in particular, there were two kinds of sludge. There was a process sludge. Back then, uh, in order to be eligible for this particular program, you needed a certain kind of account uh, in which the money could be deposited. To get that account, you needed to have a birth certificate for your child. In order to get that birth certificate, you needed a social insurance number. Uh, and the people who were eligible for this benefit were the kind of people who were actually working two, three jobs, trying to support their family. They had children to look after. Uh, they didn't have the time to do all of this. Government offices were shut at five o'clock. Uh, and by the time they finished work, uh, the relevant offices that, uh, that, that needed to be visited were, were closed. So, so that was one problem. And so, you know, a part of the solution had to do with fixing that problem, making it easier for people to get that birth certificate and to apply uh, for the social uh, number and so on and so forth. The other problem had to do with the emotional spotlight. And what that was, was that uh, in order to set up this account, you actually had to go into a bank or a credit union. You had to speak to the agent. There was a separate line for people opening up these accounts. And everybody in the branch would therefore know that you were here to apply for welfare. Right? Now, it turns out that a lot of people that were eligible for this program were new immigrants. They came from cultures uh, where it, it wasn't... Um, they didn't feel comfortable with the world knowing that they were seeking welfare. Right. And, and so the fact that the welfare process was so visible 
put a friction. It was, a, it was an emotional spotlight. So, so oftentimes we find that people don't do things. They don't accept welfare. They don't take food stamps because they don't want people to know that they need government assistance. We saw this recently, well, not recently, a few years ago uh, in India, right? In, in India, uh, all of the old welfare programs used to be done in the old fashioned way, check mailed out and people had to go to the village office and collect their payments. And now that there is a national identity system, uh, the Aadhaar system, uh, to which your welfare accounts are linked and your bank accounts are linked, payments come invisibly. And now, if I get a benefit or a subsidy from the government, I don't, you don't need to know that. Uh, and, and, and it's made a big difference in terms of take up rates and, and uh, welfare. So those are the kinds of aspects of sludge that I think we don't worry about too much. We, we focus a lot on paperwork burdens, and I think that's, that's good. Uh, but I think we need to start looking at processes a bit more carefully to see, do we impose any communication frictions? Do we impose any emotional burdens on citizens? Uh, and once we can do that, once we can audit processes, uh, then I think it becomes a, a, a lot easier, right? Let me give you just one, one more example, uh, and, and then I'll uh, turn it back to you. Uh, and this is uh, based on work done by some of my colleagues here at the center, uh, Sonia Kang and Joyce He, where they were looking at a completely different process um, on uh, diversity and inclusion. The question they were asking is, uh, in many organizations, why don't women or ethnic minorities get promoted at the same rate as other people? Right? And, and they started doing the research and it wasn't about the number of women or the number of minorities that were in organizations, but it had to do with the process. Right? Uh, so in a lot of organizations, uh, every employee after a certain period of time has passed needs to put up their hand and tell their supervisor, please consider me for promotion. It's not as simple as that, but in essence, that's what you do. You need to express an interest. You need to come up for promotion, right? Uh, and essentially they learned that women don't do that because uh, the emotional spotlight is again on them. Many minorities don't do that, all right? And so if you simply change the process to make it a default that Mary, you've spent four years, I'm gonna put you up for promotion unless you tell me not to, it turns out a lot more women, a lot more minorities, come up for promotion and get promoted, right? Again, a classic example of a simple change in the process that reduces the emotional spotlight. So uh, I'll just conclude by saying sludge is everywhere. Sludge, it's not like people deliberately introduce sludge. I mean, that happens often, uh, but it's not like governments are trying to make it particularly hard for citizens to claim welfare or companies are trying hard to prevent women from getting promoted. Uh, but we have systems that we haven't updated as the world has changed. And I think we need to keep watching out for sludge. Sludge is a lot like weeds in your backyard. It's not like we plant weeds or it's not like my neighbor comes in and plants weeds in my backyard. They just show up, right? So we have to be really careful and keep monitoring our processes. So back to you, Jafar. That's, that's hey. my quick take on sludge. Thank you, thank you, Dilip. Before I go to Reynolds, I just wanted to, uh, to, to let other uh, guests know that these are issues that you all have done a lot of work uh, on research. And, and, and so if you have comments, if you want to come in, please just come in, raise your hand and, and, and come in. So uh, now to Renos. In your work with the World Bank, you emphasize the importance of behavioral science insights into, in, in the fight against poverty in the world. Could you explain this approach and mention some examples of the application? Over to you, Renz. Thank you, Jafar. And uh, I, I want to join Kath and Dilip in thanking for this timely event. Um, I guess I'll add a little bit of a, an additional nuance to some of the things already mentioned. Um, I guess from our point of view, we have a few buckets of dimensionality that we worry uh, in, in development specifically. So one is this idea that was mentioned earlier around bandwidth, uh, which is especially and, and scarcity uh, and, and you know, kind of mental uh, capacity to make decisions or, or focus in many different problems at the same time. And, and, and a lot of what we know is that in a context of poverty, that's really, put an additional burden uh, to more effective policy because people worry about, you know, hunger, immediate needs, as opposed to should I go sign up for 
this amazing program, or et, et cetera. Um, uh, so, so the second is that we also worry about the distributional impacts of policies. So that adds a little bit of nuance to how we try to think uh, of interventions and, and policy effectiveness because, uh, and I think that brings a little bit of this idea of how you better tailor and, and customize or personalize interventions to, to meet specific type of challenges and, and, and constraints, behavioral constraints to that. So a lot of our diagnostics tries to, uh, to tease out uh, some of these insights before we get into kind of intervention design. But the, the one thing that was sort of mentioned by um, Kaz and, and, and Dilip is, is this idea. We, we also deal in, you know, in, in uh, hundreds of, you know, literally countries. Uh, and there is this kind of cultural angle to it, uh, but also there is this, uh, uh, what, what we, we find a lot of nuances around, you know, mental models and the interpretation of the world uh, that comes from different places and within different, you know, within the same setting or country uh, across kind of different parts of the, of the society. And, and and I think that's one, in a way, very important nuance uh, in, in, in our interventions. We do worry about the sludge space and the choice architecture and making systems flow much better. But we're also finding that a lot of the interventions fail because the beneficiaries fail at step one, which is even considering an intervention that is that it can be meaningful for them. Uh, and, and that gets us into these spaces of beliefs and social norms and, you know, aspirations, uh, which is a slightly different, uh, uh, you know, kind of takes us to a different types of uh, direction in terms of interventions. And, and, and I think that that's, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of depth and, and a lot of challenges, to be honest, in, in how we design uh, interventions. The, the next element that we worry is that, you know, and, and I think both uh, Dilip and, and Kaz talked about, there's two agents in this system, there's beneficiaries and then there's policymakers and frontline workers. And what we find is that we, we need to work on both uh, dimensions and we need to understand the behavior constraints and the process by which each group kind of behaves uh, because we can have, the most beautifully designed intervention, but nobody takes it up. Um, or we can, again, have a theoretically nice idea, but nothing gets implemented because the frontline workers don't have any, you know, kind of a, any 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 way of doing it because they're burdened by other things. So, and so what we are trying to do in our intervention when we can is to try to tackle both of these kind of a, uh, you know, agents, I guess, in, 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 the, in, the, in the system. Um, the, I guess a couple of examples that sort of balance some of these things uh, is, you know, in education, we have done quite a lot of work around thinking about the relationship between students and teachers. And, and in many settings, when we do our diagnostics, we do find one that systematically uh, you know, teachers have their own biases about different, you know, types of students, and that comes into the classroom uh, in terms of the quality of interaction with specific groups of students. Uh, you can, you know, come up with your own scenarios, you know, kind of a, that, that makes sense, but, but there is some kind of a, in a way, you know, prejudice or, or bias in terms of, you know, kind of a somebody believing that this type of students may not learn as good as others, and therefore the effort that goes into that function and the relationship, uh, you know, kind of suffers. Uh, and the flip side is students themselves, and again, that's where poverty and distribution comes in. We, we find that especially in contexts where students are less you know, you know, there's less equality of opportunities of being exposed to different uh, different elements of you know culture and economics and 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 and, and ideas. Uh, there is a lot of you know, kind of a, a, there is a disadvantage, especially in more vulnerable groups, in terms of the own understanding of how people learn, and, and that becomes a bottleneck for for opening up and learning because people think you know I, I'm not able to learn. Uh, so we've done in many countries, you know, variations of, you know, kind of interventions where on one end, 
we try to tackle some of these attitudes of teachers uh, by by giving them uh, different perspectives uh, and, and different uh, ways of them understanding better and creating more empathy to you know students and different types of students so we have some interventions we're trying to do for example in the context of Syrian refugees in in host countries where kind of home country teachers are going through this training where they can see as you know the perspective of a Syrian student and their challenges in integrating in a classroom but also see kind of the the local kind of student and, and see and, and then that brings a better understanding and, and, and kind of the theory behind that is that that creates more empathy and more ability to improve the relationship and the understanding towards the students and, and therefore the quality of, of teaching and performance. Uh, on the student side, we've done quite a lot of works where we introduce in the curriculum in different ways, uh, very many times short, sometimes more in-depth uh, curriculum that touches on uh, these ideas of how do people learn and, and to introduce this idea that everybody can learn uh, the idea of reflecting, the idea of failing, the idea of, uh, of uh, you know, things is a process. Uh, and, and, and I think a lot of these, you know, kind of, a, you know, grids and growth mindset kind of a theories uh, come to mind. And, and, and what we found in a lot of those interventions, they're particularly effective for more more vulnerable populations, so poorer populations, more rural students, Roma, you know, uh, sometimes uh, there's a gender element to it. Uh, you know, it, it's um, so. So I think these are examples where we have found, you know, increases in you know test performance and changes in 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 you know in attitudes and more effort. And a little bit breaking some of these, you know, kind of a, uh, you know, views and beliefs uh, by teachers. Uh, a second bucket of work we've done is in the labor market. We we've done a lot of work around uh, youth unemployment and job search. Uh, and 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 there again, there's a couple of things that are of interest. One is this idea that many youth are very discouraged in many settings and they don't even consider, you know, kind of a employment as something viable uh, for many years. So how do you break the thing? And, 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 and what we found is by, you know, by building a lot of tools around aspirations, around goal orientation, uh, you know, kind of breaking down complex ideas, you know, how do you become a CEO to, to kind of become more realistic about the steps that you go there, uh, better tools towards planning uh, uh, can actually go quite a long way in improved job search. Um, and then on the flip side, on the policy makers, a lot of many countries have, you know, unemployment offices and, and you know, how do you help the those social workers or the employment officer to provide a much more relatable and much more uh, kind of empathetic kind of interaction as opposed to kind of this more bureaucratic interaction, which is, you know, here's the form, you know, you do this and, and, and disappear versus a bit more tailoring to, to specific needs. And, 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 and again, you know, what, what we found in different settings that that can increase, you know, uh, employment search by, you know, 10, 20 percentage points, depending on the setting and, and, and what we're trying to push further now is to kind of this transition into transition into jobs and then kind of get more into kind of the interventions around productivity, et cetera. Um, I, I, I guess the the only the one last example I can think of just I'm just trying to give a range of examples is in climate change, we do quite a lot these days on take up of you know kind of different types of uh, energy or more efficient technologies. And, and, and again, a lot of what we're finding there um is uh, is that if you are able to um to customize the communication and provide much more relevant information to specific groups you can actually uh help people make kind of decisions to switch to different technologies one example i can think of is in south africa we we're actually uh during the the big water crisis they had a few years ago uh, we were doing some work on communicating, you know, kind of messaging to reduce water consumption. And, and what's interesting with that work is that, that uh, communication that talked about savings worked extremely well to the poorer parts of the city in, in Cape Town, uh, whereas 
communication that was framing more status and recognition and you know congratulations you're a good citizen really works for the higher consumption more affluent parts of, of the city and again this speaks to this idea of diagnostics and speaks to the idea of, of tailoring and understanding distributional impacts and, and, and being more precise about interventions and not thinking about the, the average intervention. So I'll, I'll stop here. And hey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Renes. Now let's go closer to home. Mary McLennan, uh, as the Senior Advisor on Behavioral Science in the UN Executive Office of the Secretary General, can you explain to us what is the UN commitment to the application of behavioral science and how it is being mainstream in uh, in the organization. Over to you, Mary. Great, thank you for that question, Jafar, as well as the opportunity to join you all today to talk about behavioral science in the UN and to be on this panel of some, some great uh, other speakers as well. So, uh, so to answer your question, I'll answer it probably in two parts. So first is to take a a look at the big picture view about the commitment, mostly at the senior levels I can speak to given where I'm located in the UN. And then I'll cover some ways in which entities are actually progressing towards embedding behavioral science into their organization. So get some, some, uh, some detail as well. So I'm gonna put a few things in the chat. Hopefully this works and it's, it's possible, um, which I will speak to uh, now. So um, if you've been a part of behavioral science or have been to any events in behavioral science in the UN from the UN Behavioral Science Group, there's a good chance you've heard of the UN Secretary General's guidance note on behavioral science. It was released last year along uh, with a report which, experience, which outlines the experiences of 25 entities applying behavioral science across the UN. Uh, this was in UN Behavioral Science Week last year. So a lot of fanfare and interest around that. It speaks to the ways in which the Secretary General sees applying behavioral science to policy and programming, as well as to the sludge, which Dilip and uh, Cass spoke to earlier. So we're calling it more administrative burden in the UN, but it is in essence sludge. Um, so that guidance, that note, which is in the resources I've shared in the chat, you can check it out for more detail if you'd like to know. And then the other signal of support from senior levels is uh, relatively more recent, and it's in relation to our common agenda, which you may have heard about. It's uh, spreading across the UN system. It's essentially the Secretary General's plan for his second term, which began earlier this year, and will go for the next five years. And in that plan, it's quite ambitious. It's intended to turbocharge the SDGs to make them more meaningful and, and effective to progress those efforts. But for the sake of our conversation today, in this agenda from the Secretary General is what's called the Quintet of Change. And these are five areas that have been identified to really um, make the UN more nimble and effective to deliver on this agenda. So they are behavioral science, data, innovation, digital work, as well as strategic foresight. So it's really good to see behavioral science elevated to such a level um, there. And you can check out some of the resources uh, for further detail if you're interested. So those are kind of the strong signals of support. Beyond that, we've had numerous discussions and I'm happy to speak to that as well if anyone's interested in kind of the more uh, nitty gritty details. But with respect to what the UN's doing to embed behavioral science, uh, I'll speak to some of the efforts first of the UN Behavioral Science Group, which is, as Jafar mentioned, an initiative I lead um, alongside my work in the Secretary General's office. So, the UN Behavioral Science Group brings together over a thousand UN colleagues from more than 60 entities and 110 countries. So quite a lot of interest and enthusiasm for behavioral science and great to see so many of you joining us today, over 500, almost 600 of you. So the group, what we do is we aim to um, bring together colleagues from a variety of, of uh, the group is quite diverse. So uh, they range not only in geographies across the countries and in the different contexts, as, as Reynos mentioned, the importance of diagnostics. So we work across a lot of different contexts. Um, also regarding uh, the, the domain, so from health, climate, gender, peace and security. And then also the group is diverse in that colleagues have a variety in terms of their um, experiences applying behavioral science themselves. So although we have some behavioral scientists in the UN, by far most of the people in this group are at the early stages of their journey, thinking about how to apply behavioral science in one project, maybe going from one project to two projects. So that's really where we're trying to, to help and support as well. So in our role, we try to support as best we can across all of these uh, diverse um, perspectives that the group brings. And we do this in a variety of ways. So we have uh, webinars where we kind of connect people across not only the UN system, but also entities themselves working in similar areas to uh, share lessons learned, as well as to perhaps even avoid duplication in certain situations. 
We also uh, provide some thought leadership. So the documents I've shared in the chat uh, were produced by the UN Behavioral Science Group and co-created with UN, UN colleagues as well. Uh, we also have recently launched a UN behavioral science team where we work actually on projects. We bring behavioral scientists into the UN system to engage with us on actual projects, and I'm happy to speak to that as well. And then outside of that, we're also working on training opportunities as well as more senior leadership engagement. So that's, that's the group. Um, but I did want to mention what other entities are actually doing in the space to, to progress behavioral science uh, themselves. So, I would like to mention the World Bank. I know Brenos is with us today, but they are across the UN system. Um, the only behavioral science team that we are aware of. So great to see the efforts they have there. And I, I might put the, the website, your website in the chat, Renos, because it's a really good resource of all the case studies, examples. Also, they recently reduced, released a document on carrying out a, a diagnostic when it comes to behavioral science application, which is kind of seemed to be quite useful to colleagues as well. Um, so there's the World Bank has a team. UNDP has what's called Accelerator Labs, which I'm sure we might have some colleagues on, on the call to, with us today from Accelerator Labs, but they work more in the innovation space and sort of local innovation, but uh, they also have produced some really great behavioral science projects over the years, so I can also maybe share that as well as a resource. So that's to say that each entity is kind of taking a different approach when it comes to behavioral science. Those are two of the kind of the mo more advanced. Um, but entities are really at, at different stages of their journey. And hopefully through our fellowship program that we have now with our team, we have projects ranging from uh, missing disinformation to sludge reduction to child nutrition with WFP, Department of Global Communications, res resident coordinators offices. So we're doing pieces across the UN, but hopefully there'll be more, more stories like, um, like the World Bank and UNDP to go forward as well. So I'll stop there. And just to say as well, if you would like to join the UN Behavioral Science Group and you're in the UN, click on the link and you can do so. Um, you have to confirm your subscription, so just be mindful of that. And if you are not in the UN, but you'd like to stay up to date on what we're doing, sign up for the group as well. You can join as an observer and you can also receive our newsletter, which we have one coming out next week. And you can also follow us on Twitter if you want some more real-time understanding of where we are. So I'll stop there, um, but thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. And uh, publicly, thank you for all the support you, you have been giving us at the Staff College and also uh, with helping us to hire our first behavior science learning specialist. So uh, um, we're also moving into that direction. Thank you. And just before I go to Dili for the second question, I wanted to remind all of you that we have, we're a little bit behind time, maybe about seven, eight minutes. So if I can ask you to be a, a bit more concise in, in your responses. Now, over to, to Dilip. You have been advancing the uh, concept of behavioral informed organizations. This idea implies the use of behavioral science, not only for public policy design, but also for managing any type of organization, including in business. How do you see this concept being accepted by the industry and private sector in general? Over to you, there. Uh, that's a great question. It's a, it's an uh, like with any innovation, it will be a slow burn. It will take some time before the idea percolates and takes roots. But let's let's kind of step back a little bit and, and and talk about what we mean by this. The the first thing I do want to say, uh, and we'll talk about this at the end if we have time, is after listening to Cass and Mary and Renos and Dilip, it's tempting to to say that oh, if I hire a bunch of behavioral scientists, I can solve all of the world's problems or I can solve the organizing's problem. Not true. I, uh, in fact, it's the furthest from the truth. The way I think about it uh, is I see a lot of problems in organizations are behavioral problems, but not all solutions are behavioral solutions, right? And so sometimes it's as simple as fixing uh, a process or as, as simple as uh, streamlining information. So that not everything has to be about psychology, but I think it's, it's a useful skill to have to look at the way our stakeholders are looking at our problems, right? Empathy is a scarce resource. Uh, and the one thing I have learned is that if I look back at my own experience and try and project that into what my stakeholders or what my citizens are experiencing, there's a pretty good chance that my experience does not match to yours. Uh, and in fact, one of the biggest mistakes we make is we say, well, I would have done this, therefore everybody else would do this. That's a huge mistake. So a behaviorally informed organization understands that. It is, it understands that uh, its stakeholders, be they citizens or customers, are 
uh, to use language that Cass and Richard Taylor first used in their book. They're humans and not econs, right? So they're not rational. Uh, they are sometimes erratic. They forget to do stuff, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the other hallmark of humanity is, of course, the, the lack of consistency, right? Uh, in economics, we call it heterogeneity. Different people are different. We know that, right? But what's also important is not only are people different from each other, they are also different from themselves at different points in time. So I invite everybody on this call to think about how you made decisions on a weekday versus a weekend or when you were processing information on a computer screen versus on paper or uh, alone versus in a group. We, we are different from ourselves. And I think we need to recognize that a lot more. Uh, in, in the for-profit world, we have this concept called segmentation. We say, well, let's group people into different chunks. And that's great, right? But it doesn't mean that if you're a millennial or a, a baby boomer uh, or you live in Africa, that you behave like everybody else in that segment. That's actually not true. And I think we need to start acknowledging that. So I think that's important, right? A behaviorally informed organization designs for humans and not for econs. When we design products and processes and services, we need to assume that our people will not understand information, that they might forget to do stuff and that they might not even be motivated to do things that we think they should. So I think these are all things that are important to build in as we design processes. Uh, a behaviorally informed organization is empirically driven. It believes in experiments. It believes in the test, learn, and adapt approach. Uh, and I think it then creates the mechanisms to, to test uh, ideas, uh, knowing that the optimal idea will change as a function of context and as a function of who the stakeholder is. Uh, I kind of see behaviorally informed organizations as having like three components. There's obviously, you know, Gas spoke about it, Reynos, Mary, you've all spoken about the mindset of viewing your stakeholders as humans as opposed to econs. We need to, we need to embrace that mindset. We need to learn through experiments. We need to be able to have the ability to collect data quickly and learn what's driving people and what's not. But I think the third piece, which is the more important piece, uh, is we need to have the ability in our organizations to adapt and pivot once we've learned. Right, So it's all very fine to do experiments and, and learn that the way we communicated about the product isn't the optimal way uh, for this given circumstance. But if our communication plans are locked in for the next six months, well, that doesn't help because now you've learned and you can't do anything about it. Right, And so I think these are the three things we need to think about. So is this concept infusing in organizations? Yes, it is. Is there any organization that is actually there? No, there isn't because it is a complex thing to build in. It will be done in pieces. Uh, but again, in the chat, I've posted uh, a link to our, our webpage on behaviorally informed organizations. A lot of progress that has been made, but a lot more that needs to be done. Uh, the good news, I think, is that organizations, both for profit and not for profit and governments, are increasingly uh, aware of and open to the idea of being behaviorally informed. So I'll pause there uh, and, and turn it back to you, Jeffrey. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Now to Renos, you know, over the last two years and still continues, we're talking about vaccine hesitancy. Um, and God knows for how long more we got to be talking about this. So you've, you've studied it and um, can you please explain how behavioral science can be applied to help save lives in this important area? Vaccine hesitancy, over to you. Yeah, so being stuck at home and being forced to uh, do everything virtually, actually, it's it's one it's one example that helped our, our thinking into this to have to do things a bit of scale and fast and iterative. Uh, we when the you know when the the vaccine you know started being distributed, you know, a, a lot of the effort at the bank was really about the system, the supply, the distribution. Um, and, but quickly, you know, we we also felt and started thinking about, well, eventually, you know, there's going to be uh, some issues about on the demand side. And, and uh, so we started, um, the way we approached this uh, in, at, at the bank was to try to think of ways to have very quick feedback to um, uh, to to, uh, to, uh, to governments. Uh, and and I think there the the important thing to you know, that we needed to understand was 
two things. One was um, the, the distribution of different uh, types of beliefs and attitudes towards the vaccine. Uh, and, and the second was to understand who could be the best messengers, uh, because clearly if you kind of think conceptually about take up of vaccine, you know, there's kind of three things that need to happen. One, people to believe in it, to be easily available to it. Um, and, and, uh, and, and so, so we created a, basically an online tool and we, we leverage a lot of partnership uh, with uh, an, an alliance on the, for health online, which has many partners, including uh, kind of social media platforms. And we started basically recruiting and listening uh, across different countries. Uh, we've done it now in about 30 or so countries uh, and we have collected information of more than 200,000 people over the last you know, year or so. And, and basically there was two, three things we wanted to do. One, to understand the different personas of attitudes and use that to understand how to better tailor communication, uh, test that, have evidence of what may or may not work and then help do it in line and in uh, supporting the ministries of health and their communication teams and other local partners in each country to reach and re re revise their campaigns. As Dilip said, you know, this was a, you know, a, a lot of these plans, you know, take time communication plans in government. And so we wanted to be very nimble about it. Um, we leveraged technology, we created a chatbot, so that made it quick, we use, you know, we use on, you know, kind of Facebook ads to, to recruit people. So on average, we ended up with, uh, you know, large samples, seven, 8,000 uh, people per country. Uh, and, and, and we did an experiment with different messaging uh, and, and, and then use kind of the more effective messages to then, dis, you know, kind of give advice to, to, to each, uh, each government of how they could go about uh, building that. Um, and the second issue that came up in this analysis was this idea of messengers, like a, a, a huge bottleneck in that what we're finding in the hesitancy space is that most people in most countries trust health workers and the kind of the health practitioners. Well, it turns out that the distribution of beliefs of health practitioners more or less mirrors exactly the same, the, the, that of the general population. So, Yes, there's people, you know, so 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 in, in, in the sense that creates a big problem because if we depend on a messenger who's hesitant themselves or has issues either because they're worried about the risk or they have issues with the government and trust or they are completely kind of more on the anti-vax, uh, clearly the effectiveness of having a campaign that has the health practitioners be the messengers and, and, and help to, to promote vaccine distribution it's, it's not bound to be very successful. Uh, so a lot of that opens some uh, elements of support that we could think about uh, some of potentially communicating with health workers, some of the curriculum in the training material and, and how to help health workers in a way kind of a, you know, kind of a work through the, this, uh, this type of uh, work. Uh, so, so what's been nice about this example in the vaccine hesitancy is that it also forced us to find ways to have a very quick turnaround, like a typical engagement in a country was probably, I wanna say four to six weeks from kind of day of let's do it to actually uh, presenting kind of results and discussing kind of next steps. Uh, and in a few countries, you know, this has been taken up uh, at, at larger scale by the governments. And in some cases, uh, we have been able to actually do more work and more in-depth work uh, with different governments. So, so it's been a, it's been an interesting kind of example where you know, being at home and forced to innovate uh, and and come up with kind of a, a a very kind of a clean and and quick solution uh, that that it has actually you know we were able to leverage kind of technology and do this. Thank you, thank you, Renos. Let's go now go to uh, uh, Mary. Uh, actually, let me make sure, sorry, sorry. Yes, Mary. Um, you just organized the 2022 UN Behavioral Science Week. If you're gonna pick one, two sort of main conclusions that you got out of this, what are they? 
Yes, a good question. Good point. Um, so I think some of the colleagues who worked on UN Behavioral Science Week with me are on the call today. So I want to first acknowledge that this UN Behavioral Science Week was a team effort across the UN system. So I'll just put again in the chat some links if you're curious to know more about what it is. Um, there's the agenda as well as um, a YouTube playlist of all the recordings. So essentially what it is, is the UN Behavioral Science Week brought together 18 UN entities and over in 21 sessions. Um, discussing various ways in which the UN is applying or thinking about applying behavioral science to progress its mandates. Um, so it was attended by thousands of individuals from within the UN as well as outside the UN and featured some really great talks from across the entities as well as speakers including Undersecretary General Turk and Undersecretary General Melissa Fleming as well as professors such as Professor John List and Professor Iris Bonet. So we had a nice spectrum of of people join us. And those recordings, again, are on that link that I've shared. Um, so this is, just to give some context and history, this is the fourth UN Behavioral Science Week. Uh, the second we've had open sort of to the public, but we've had a number of, of discussions internally as well. So with respect to where we are uh, with behavioral science overall, I think some of the things that the big takeaway for me was that there's really a lot of in growing interest and demand for behavioral science across the UN. Last year, we had under 10 ent entities work with us on the week. This year, we had 18, and next year, there will be even more. So lots of entities are interested in participating the week and in doing so, learning about or showcasing the work that they're doing in this space. So I think it's an indicator of kind of how things are evolving across the UN overall. And one, one thing to say about this is that it was a really interesting um, exercise having led this week with, with other colleagues and that we had, we co-designed the, the agenda and everything together, which meant that we had entities who are very new to behavioral science interacting with others who are more advanced, such as the World Bank and others. So we had nice discussions about how entities can learn from each other in, in discussing where they are with behavioral science, where they could potentially go. So those are, um, that's kind of one key takeaway. I think some broad themes that have come out throughout the week kind of echo some of the remarks I made earlier in that given that many entities are at the early stages of their journey, um, we saw a lot about interest in more awareness, particularly in certain corners of the UN. You, know, you go to parts where people don't really know much about behavioral science and then other corners where there's a lot of work going on. So really kind of awareness is still the thing we need to build in different parts of the UN as well as thinking about more senior leadership buy-in, this is something that we're working on, um, but also kind of echoing, needing more of that to really progress and not only um, buying into behavioral science, but even knowing what behavioral science is, again, awareness at that level. And then another thing that just kept coming up, which is probably very unsurprising for those who work in the behavioral science space is this importance of um, understanding individuals and local context. So again, echoing some of the remarks that Reynolds made and others about really kind of taking that, that deep understanding of, of the context, which is ultimately what we're looking at um, to apply behavioral science. So those are some of the broader themes, but those are some really big picture thinking. Next week, if you join the UN Behavioral Science Group, you'll receive a newsletter with uh, much more detailed takeaways from the week. We've spoken to all of the entities who participated to submit kind of their takeaways from their experiences as well. So it can be a nice sort of snapshot of where the UN is with respect to work across these 18 entities. And that we'll, we'll release that next week. So there'll be more to share to share then. But it's another thing to flag as well is that um, we do have a challenge that has come up quite frequently is that there are limited technical skills in applying behavioral science across the UN. So as I said, we're at the early stages of our journey, not quite there yet uh, towards mainstreaming, more like thinking about embedding in various ways. So. Um, thinking about how we can augment our behavioral science capacities, again, a theme that came up overall. So that's the week. Uh, if you join the group, you can hear about next year's week, as well as ways you can get engaged. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Jeff. Thanks. Thank you, Mary. Now we're going to the last round of questions. Uh, if I can ask all of you to uh, please limit your response to three minutes so we can stay on time and finish at five. But let me go quickly to uh, Dilip. Um, no doubt that the behavioral science in policy making is growing, um, but the mainstreaming of this has not really achieved a high level so far. What, in your views, are, are, are the problem? And uh, what do you think is the best way to move forward? Okay. Forward. So um, I'd say a couple of things. First, I think we have had remarkable success over the past 14 or 15 years on pilot projects demonstrating success. We heard a lot about these today. 
we haven't had any success at all scaling them very well, right? And and John List, who was at the conference, probably spoke a, a, a fair bit about scaling challenges. Uh, so I think that's that's one area we need to do a lot of work on. My my own take on this is. Uh, there is an incentive problem. We have behavioral units inside governments and other entities whose job is to produce pilots. It is nobody's job to scale them. Uh, so I think we need to sort of organizationally think about how we're going to embed the notion of scaling into the way our pilots become successful. So that's one. I think the other big challenge for us as a field is the lack of portability of our findings. And what I mean by that is it is a fairly robust finding in the behavioral sciences that our effects are specific to certain situations, certain contexts. If you change the context, the effect changes. Uh, and what that means is just because a program worked really well for Reynos, let's say in designing a cash transfer system in Africa, doesn't mean that same idea is going to work for me today in Canada or in India or in Sri Lanka, right? Uh, situation is different, timing is different. Uh, and, and what that actually means is that we really need to test ideas and avoid doing what I call nudge store shopping, right? Just reading reports and saying, ah, Mary changed the framing of, uh, of a reward and got more people to participate. I could do the same thing. You, you could but don't deploy it unless you test it out, right? Ronald Reagan always said, trust but verify. And I think that's a great motto for behavioral science. If we can trust our research, but also verify that it works in our situation, I think we will cut out a lot of sort of, you know, uh, instances where things don't work. We've all talked about projects that worked well. For every project that worked well, we probably each had three or four that didn't work at all. And I think our goal as a field is to improve that success rate and we can do it if we make experimentation the norm and we test everything before we deploy it. So those are my two quick thoughts. Again, I'll leave with the point that behavioral science isn't a silver bullet. It's not as easy as just doing what other people did. Uh, there's a bit of work that goes into it. Thank you, Thank you very much. <clears throat> Renault's so social cohesion, weakness of it, lack of it that we experience today. Can you elaborate on what this means in our daily lives and the potential of behavioral science to help societies achieve better degrees of social cohesion? Over to you. Yeah, I mean, in, in, in some ways, most of the big issues we have in the world right now, it's about better communication with each other. Uh, and, uh, and and I guess there, you know, the, the way, you know, to think about it is one, how can you improve interactions between different groups that have, you know, different opinions and find some common ground and, 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 and also orient discussions towards the future and, and find those common goals and, and work together. Uh, the idea is not to solve every single problem in the universe, but at least move to a constructive direction. The, the, the second issue uh, the second related concept is how can we help people have a better perspective, even if we cannot have them to interact with different groups for all sorts of reasons. So, so how do you facilitate uh, that? Uh, the third related issue is how do you manage, uh, you know, the information flows? You know, we all live in our different clouds, uh, online and offline, and we, you know, as, as we heard today, you know, we, we hear like we're stuck with the, around 1% of the universe and our understanding and explanation of the universe. And we, we really don't have any access or willingness to access other points of views. And, and, and on top of that, you have this issue of misinformation. A lot of things are online these days or offline uh, that are very confusing and, and making sense out of it. Uh, it doesn't doesn't work. So uh, so we've been trying to think how how can you know how how can we address uh, some of these uh, elements? And there's different you know also you know from from issues related to relationship of refugee and host countries to issues related to uh, you know uh, groups uh, or, or kind of uh, indigenous groups versus uh, kind of a you know, kind of a more you know, other populations um, in the context of specific interventions, it could be some of the examples I mentioned earlier with, you know, students versus uh, teachers. Uh, and, I, and I guess a lot of our interventions these days that try to, to address some of these things have to do 
with either finding solutions to bring people together and, and in, in more meaningful ways. So we've had some work where we have created kind of citizens platforms and have solved some of the bottlenecks of interaction. So in settings where there's multiple countries, we have built platforms that automatic translate, you know, kind of, so the users sees their language and they can communicate with everybody in any language, irrespective of the differences of languages. Uh, uh, but again, having interactions that are more meaningful and, 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 and more towards geared to the future. And what we've been finding in some of our evaluations is that those have tended at least in, in our small, you know, kind of a universe of examples to, to increase uh, indicators of trust uh, between groups, uh, increase interaction with, with, uh, between groups, uh, and potentially a focus on, on better, better outcomes. And, and, and the last, and, and on misinformation, what we've been trying to do now, you know, kind of thinking a little bit about theories of, of, of how to address misinformation, we, we have invested in and we're testing right now a tool, a game, an online game through WhatsApp, where it tries to work on uh, pre-banking, which kind of, the, it's, a, it's the exact idea of, uh, of, of vaccination, but for misinformation. So let's provide people with the tools to understand and identify when something is likely to be misinformation so they don't share uh, right away, uh, which is the biggest issue if misinformation is the sharing is not the production of misinformation. Uh, so we are testing kind of interventions like that and, and we're trying to see if those can be done uh, through technological you know, use and, and bring it a little bit more scale. Uh, and and so, so that's a little bit kind of the, the types of things we're dealing with in social cohesion space. Thank you. Great, thank you. And to Mary, ethics. You know, when we talk about behavioral science, ethics comes into uh, 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 the conversation. Now, let me you 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 have participated with UNICEF um, uh, in their efforts to facilitate managing ethical considerations specific to apply to applying behavioral science approaches to designing programs for children. Can you tell us a little bit about this issue? Yes, certainly. It's a very, very good question. And one that comes up consistently in different ways in the conversations that we have um, across the UN. Um, it's something we take very seriously, especially the context in which the UN works and the nature of the work of behavioral science. So um, first, maybe I'll, I'll speak to the document that you mentioned in your question, this document from UNICEF's uh, Office of Research in Nocenti, uh, which was developed with the Behavioral Insights team. And it looks at considerations applying behavioral science when it comes specifically to working with children. And I think it's a great document in that it really looks at it from a UN perspective and the way that issues are outlined are really relevant to UN colleagues. So even if you're not working with children, I think it's a good resource and I'll put it in the chat shortly. Um, but I also think too, what they've done is they've really worked with behavioral science experts, but also with people who work in ethics um, to really kind of merge those fields together. Um, so that's kind of a key resource I would point you toward overall. Uh, but in terms of what we're doing, I should also say Ben Hickler at uh, UNICEF's Office uh, of Research uh, in Ocenti led in the development of that. Um, so in terms of us, what we're doing, um, so we're still having conversations across the UN in terms of how to reflect upon this and what would make the most sense for the UN system. What we have done so far is we're sharing uh, what's called For Good, which is a framework produced by uh, Liam Delaney and Leo Lattis from University College Dublin, which looks at some considerations, uh, broad considerations for applying behavioral science um, in, public, in policy context. So um, we think it's helpful because it's not, it doesn't go too far down the behavioral science methodology track, but it does help you kind of think through what issues might be relevant to you. For instance, if uh, one of the things in the framework talks about respect, and even if you may not know much about behavioral science from a starting, starting point, as many colleagues do don't in the UN, they can think about what respect might mean uh, for vaccination programs in Zimbabwe versus um, Argentina versus Chile. So I think just thinking through these concepts can be very helpful. So I'll share that um, shortly in the chat well now. Um, and then outside of that, the group will continue to have discussions about ethics as we go forward. Uh, we're thinking about maybe producing some documentation or even our own our advisory board ourselves. So we're thinking about different things, um, but we'll come to that shortly. So just to say in the few minutes I have here, it's a very important and an interesting issue. We could probably fill an hour and a half talking just about ethics, but I, I'll stop and leave it for there and just share some resources in the chat for those who might be interested. Great, great. Thank you very much to uh, 
all of you. This is a really important topic and uh, um, it's a very interesting topic. So we can go on and on, but unfortunately we have to uh, uh, end at five o'clock and we're getting close. So the, my apologies to everyone who has submitted a question, but because of time, time limits that we have, I cannot address these questions, but the ones that we have, I promise that we will circulate it to our panelists and uh, we will get their answers and we will send them to you. So um, let me uh, just uh, extend a huge thanks to Cass Sunstein, Dilip Soman, Mary McLennan, and Renus Vakis for your insight today. Our work, it's very obvious in this area, in the area of behavioral science and public policy is evolving and our speakers have provided key insights uh, that should inform the future use of behavioral science in public policy. We definitely, definitely need to do uh, far better in implementing behavioral informed approaches. None of us can do this alone. We can however work together to achieve better results for uh, the people we serve. Um, let me first thank all of you, the viewers uh, who have been with us over the last hour and a half uh, for watching. Make sure to post your takeaways on social media using hashtag behavioral science for SDGs. Let me thank my um, uh, UNSCC colleagues for the help they have provided us to uh, bring this event to you. And let me also ask my colleague, Fernando Blasco, who has supported me over the last uh, oh, three, four months to design the program, invite the guests, uh, and uh, uh, bring everybody here. So thank you, Fernando. Um, please visit our website at www.unsse.org to see um, the topic for the next event and the schedule for the uh, next event that we will have hopefully um, pretty soon. So thank you all for watching. I wish you a wonderful morning, evening, afternoon. Uh, stay well, and we'll see you next time. Thank you all.